Well, the tornado disaster in Tennessee this past week once again put drones in the spotlight. The technology is invaluable in the hours and the days after a catastrophe. The eyes in the sky not only provide us images of the disaster scene, but they can also assist with search and rescue. And in some cases, drone technology still has a role to play once a community moves into the recovery phase. And let's explore that with our guest this morning. Matt Sloan is the CEO of uh, Skyfire Consulting. His company trains and certifies first responders in the use of drones. Matt, good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks for um, coming in and bringing all this, too. Absolutely. So just give us a broad sort of sweep of how first responders are using drones. Yeah, so the, the most obvious one is using a thermal imaging camera, which we have on display here. Um, obviously, two different aircraft, different types of aircraft. But this is useful for finding people when they're lost or you're searching for people in rubble piles and things like that. It can actually show the heat signature of a person um, and help first responders see something they wouldn't otherwise see. Uh, there's other ways you can use them as well to, you know, big giant sweeping overviews of damage fields. Um, you can do 3D mapping with them, all kinds of different uh, things. And you can even drop life jackets and radios and water bottles with them. Well, also in some situations, there's probably kind of a safety advantage of using drones rather than kind of putting first responders into a very dangerous situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things we're always trying to do is minimize the danger to human life. So anytime you can send a piece of plastic in there to do the work of a human being and, and keep them safe, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea. Um, a lot of times these things can go into, you know, areas with a hazmat spill or a train derailment, things like that, so people aren't having to don those suits and, and go in there and put their lives in danger. Often, though, after a natural disaster, there's temporary flying restrictions in place. So how do you manage that? How, do, how can it, does it limit, actually, what you can do? With yeah, yeah, it really does. And I think that's the most critical thing here is that, you know, anybody can go out and buy a drone at a store and, and put it up. But that really is going to limit uh, rescue operations. So the important thing is if you're going to be flying after a disaster, make sure you abide by all the rules and find the incident commander. There's always going to be an incident commander. Make sure that that person is aware of what you're doing, gives you permission to do it before you actually go in and fly, because there's going to be helicopters out there rescuing people, and you want to make sure to stay out of their way. And there were ex extensive power outages uh, after the disaster and the tornadoes in Tennessee this week. So how can drones help even utility crews restore the power even quicker? Yeah, this is fascinating to me. So you don't have to necessarily put a camera on these guys. You can actually lift stuff with them. So, uh, you know, there's a great example after Hurricane Maria um, where a power company actually used the drone to pull leader lines uh, across a gorge. And it would have taken them weeks to do that, and they actually did it in a couple hours, and so it can help them get power uh, restored more quickly and also find the problem areas. So where power is on, you can see the boxes are glowing hot, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's amazing. Now, speaking of getting power back on, a lot of times you're limited by the weather after a storm, yeah. right? Power is a great example. When it's too windy, they can't take the bucket sure. trucks up. Um, but the wind can also affect how drones fly, too. Yeah, it can. We learned that the hard way a couple of times uh, working with you guys in the field during hurricanes. But, yeah, this, this one will do about 15, 20 mile an hour wind resistance. That one will do about 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. We actually use this one with you guys in Hurricane Harvey in about 45 mile an hour winds. It's also uh, water resistant too, uh, to some degree. So you can fly in in some conditions, but not immediately after the hurricane. Let's talk about how long these things are useful as well. So it's not just the hours or perhaps a day or two. These things are also helpful in recovery even days, weeks, and months later. Yeah, as I sort of mentioned earlier, you can do 3D mapping with these things. So what's great is you can actually go in and see what it looks like before, right after, a couple days later, as recovery efforts are going on. You can look at erosion uh, and actually take those maps and take measurements. So they're really useful tools for kind of rebuilding and seeing where the problem areas are. Yeah, I know you kind of touched on this, but one thing that, that worries me is you've got emergency responders using the drones, but then you've got people who might just have a drone, you know, of their own that they want to get up there. Yeah, we hear about this in yeah. the wildfires out in California quite a bit. You know, they're interrupting fire, uh, you know, uh, operations with the big airplanes and things like that. And again, that's the, the real importance here is, you know, you're, you're basically doing the equivalent of putting a remote control car on the highway. You've got planes, you've got helicopters, you've got other uh, rescue drones. So just make sure you're getting permission. Make sure you're not doing anything that you're not supposed to be doing. And I think you can do it safely. And your equipment is not something you pick up at the dollar store. I mean, this is <laughs> no. this is like high tech uh, kind of yeah. commercial type equipment yeah. here. Yeah, this one you can actually get uh, in most uh, big box electronic stores, the, the Mavic. This one is, you know, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000, depending on the cameras. And actually, that's the most expensive part of the setup are, are the imaging uh, systems underneath, not the, the drone itself. But, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously, the, the more wind resistant you want it to be, the more weather resistant, the longer range you want to be able to see, the more money it's going to cost. How extensive is the training to learn how to actually safely operate these? So there's a there's a 60 question test that you need to pass uh, from the FAA's perspective, and that's kind of all the requirement that there is um, from a legal perspective. But to actually learn how to use these properly, uh, days to weeks, it depends on what you're doing. If you're just flying to get pretty pictures, uh, not not so much. If you're using thermography or doing you know 3D mapping, that takes a significant amount more training.
bottom line is this is probably going to change the game in terms of how quickly we can get to people in, in need. In so many ways, too. And one of the dreams that I have one day is that, you know, something like this will be inside a box in a hurricane zone. And before even the first cruise or even FEMA can get in, uh, the, the box opens up, the drone goes up and starts surveying damage even before the first people are back there. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I think we're really going to see some, some serious change. Yeah. All right, Matt Sloan, thank you so much. CEO yeah, of Skyfire Consulting. Excellent information and, of course, your life-saving information potentially. Yeah, let's kind of do uh, some kind of surveying what happened just earlier this yeah. week in Tennessee with that outbreak of severe weather. Uh, we had uh, now the second longest tornado on the ground in uh, the history here in Tennessee, just over 60 miles. That was the Davidson Wilson Smith EF3 tornado. And it was on the ground for exactly an hour, so it was moving at 60, 60 miles, miles per hour. Here is some of the damage, significant destruction. As you can see, the Donaldson Christian Academy was hard hit before and after. And, you, can, you know, roof structure, roof damage, uh, wall structure as well. Here's also uh, another house here, a couple of houses. That's before and then after. You see the roof is gone. Part of the second story is gone as well. Hence, some of the EF3 damage you can see here. Again, the tornadoes are rated on the damage to estimate the wind speed in that tornado. And it's done after the fact here. And we're talking about drones going and perhaps to survey damage because you can't get a rating on a tornado until after it has occurred and the damage is surveyed. In America, we all count.